Awesome. Welcome, Radford head coach Darius Nichols to the basketball podcast. Nichols began his coaching career as alma mater, West Virginia, as a graduate assistant in 2010. He was named an assistant at Northern Kentucky in 2011 and spent two seasons with the team before spending a season with Wofford and Louisiana Tech. He joined the coaching staff at Florida in 2015 as an assistant under former Louisiana Tech head coach Mike White. Nichols was named the head coach of Radford in April 2020. In year two, Radford went 21-15, finished tied for second in the Big South Conference, and advanced to postseason play. Coach Nichols, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Exciting to have you here. We've crossed paths a few times over the years and kept in touch and uh, grateful to have you on. And uh, year three at Radford, Coach, tell us a little bit about what's in store for year three. I mean, it's exciting. We have three all-conference guards back. So anytime, you know, it is anytime you have talented guards coming back, you you have a chance. And I think our front court is more talented than a year ago. So, you know, we're excited about it. You just got to got to put it together and all the other stuff besides talent. We got to put that those stuff together. Yeah, no question. And you built it over uh, two years so far, built it up and now year three. Last year played a little non-traditional in terms of, I, yeah. well, it's hard to say traditional, <laughs> but non-traditional nowadays with two yeah. bigs a little bit. So talk to us a, bit, a little bit about that and then some of the vision for the future. It, it's crazy because a lot of times when you go into a job, you kind of have an idea, okay, this is how I want to play. This is what I want to do. It's easy to say what you want to do in a press conference. And then just, you know, looking at our team, last year and you know that fit us the best and I think now with the transfer portal the most important thing to do first is accumulate talent and then kind of figure it out from there that's at least how I think about it and you know we had our our most talented guys were playing you know with two bigs and and those three guards that could really make shots and those two guys doing a lot of screen and actions for them a lot of floppy, a lot of different variations of that. And again, you made it work. And that's a great, great point just about the need for adaptability and flexibility as a coach nowadays, isn't it? Yeah. And this, I mean, you know, the, the rules are changing every year. And it's funny because it's not funny. It's difficult because the rules are changing, but we're not given enough time to adjust to the rules. So now with the portal and NIL over the last few years, okay, now, now I feel like we're adjusting to it. And, you know, that's kind of our philosophy is just find the best players we can find and, you know, kind of figure out what we're going to do with it later. So you mentioned that and and it makes sense to me, accumulate talent and then figure out how you can obviously help that talent become the best version of themselves within their individual and team uh, constraints in your system. So talk to me, you accumulated the talent. What is the process after that with you and your staff to be able to figure out how to play or style of play? I think the biggest thing, and I saw you talking about it is, and and something I can't remember I was watching, but I don't think we play enough. And I think when you get, and we get a lot of grad transfers, you know, when you're guys, and you got to think about those guys. Like when you get them, their jump shots, usually their jump shot by then. You know, their their ball handling is usually their ball handling by then. So you get those guys, and, and we spend a lot of time just playing and understanding that because I – I talked to some NBA coaches and, and I said, if you were a college coach, what would you do? And all of them said the same thing. I said, I will play more. You guys, you guys practice so much, but you don't play. And so I think when you get those guys, you got to try to build that chemistry on the court over, over the summer, you know, over the fall. And so we don't practice very long, but, you know, we play a lot. So we're definitely aligned on that. And I definitely think it makes sense nowadays, especially when you mentioned some of those grad transfers, because they've already practiced so much in their career too. There's right. a certain monot- monotonous part of practice that always exists. So fill us in a little bit. When you mean play and practice, what type of things are you doing in terms of creating these play situations? You know, just putting them in different scenarios. Sometimes, obviously, we do a lot of four-minute games. Sometimes we'll say, okay, this is the first four minutes of the game. You know, this is end of half. This is you know, end of game section. And, you know, sometimes we try to do creative things to get them frustrated where, you know, you put the kind of rebound and bubble up or the smaller ring where the ball doesn't go, go in as much. And, you know, one team's up the team with the bubble on is up 10 with so much time to go. And you're creating those, you're putting them in the situation you will see in the game where you're up 10 and you can't score, but you still better win the game. So just different scenarios that you're going to run into, you know, we try to get them because when you have a grad transfer guys for one or two years, you you don't know how they're going to respond to anything. You know, you're watching them on synergy, you're watching clips. So you, 
you don't really get to know them as people like you would if you brought in the freshmen and develop them over the years. And I've mentioned that to a few college coaches before. I mean, it's really hard to determine style of play without really getting to know the players truly. Right. And again, a lot of these players are in different roles than they were in their previous program as well. Cause some in somewhat you're expecting a little bit more from them at your level than they would be if they transferred down from say a high major too. Right. Yeah. And you know, a lot of the guys we, we get are looking for more opportunity, you know, and they, they come from some of the programs they come from are, are really good programs, but they weren't leaned upon to do a lot of the heavy lifting. So then you're in a different, you know, you're in a different role. So under, you know, understanding that at a totally different school, you know, I went through that role at West Virginia, my first two years, not playing as much my last two years playing a lot, but I was at the same school. So, you know, you got to understand what they're going through, adjusting to a whole new staff, you know, a whole new environment. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, unique and different challenges and uh, not better or worse. It just what is what it is. And you right. mentioned to me that you teach, you feel that you teach guys, the way you teach guys is unique. Can you explain that? Yeah, we, I mean, I can give you a few stories. I think, you know, we teach them through kind of role plan. You know, we like to act out different scenarios. It was, it was a situation. It was, a, it was last year. One of my players was frustrated uh, because he had missed a shot. So we were playing, you know, five on five, going back and back and forth. So he missed a shot about four or five possessions later. He goes and smacks a water bottle that was, you know, on the ledge or the scores table. So, you know, thinking, okay, I could say, come on, come on, BA, um, move on to the next play. You know, we say next play speed. I could easily say that, yell at him, do all that stuff. So, you know, I just told him, I said, you got to move past it. So the next day, I like going in the, fi the film room, but they never know what's going to go on in the film room. So it was right around the time where Draymond Green and the Jordan pool situation happened. So we set up a podium where I put the water bottle in front of the microphone and B.A. was in front of the other microphone and he had to do it. And we played the video of him smacking that water bottle. And then he had to do, you know, it was a mock interview and his teammates were the media and they were asking him questions why he did it. And so it was, it was a few weeks later, like he got frustrated again. And I saw on film like he wanted to react and he didn't. So I don't think he wanted to do the, you know, things like that. You got to try to make it stick out for him. I love that. That's 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 brilliant, coach. I mean, it just brings attention to it and then puts it in perspective for the rest of the world, because a lot of things in our sports environment, if you put them in the world context, these are not appropriate things to do. So that's a great example of kind of a way to be able to show that to a player and educate them about kind of how their behavior looks from the outside world in. Yeah. And, and we we always, you know, we always talk about like, you know, basketball is a game of random events. So is life. And so. A lot of times you you get guys and you see how they've been coached over the years and they've been coached so hard on their mistakes instead of, you know, the response to the mistake. And, you know, for example, I was talking to one of my players the other day and it would be like, you know, I'm talking to you, say you're one of my players. So, Chris, you shoot a corner three and you airball it. So I've seen enough airballs. I'm not mad about that. If it's a good shot, whatever. And then you you're frustrated, so you jog back on defense. So my guys to the point, they they know why they're getting taken out now. Some of them are still figuring it out. So you get taken out because you jog. Then you come to the bench and say, you know, you're pouting, you get bad body language. One assistant say it says something like, you know, don't put Chris back in the game. He's pouting or whatever. And then so I don't put him back in the game. And the text. I reenacted this in front of my guys and I said, the text you're probably going to get after the game from somebody you love and loves you is going to say something like, I can't believe coach took you out for that air ball. And you have to tell them, no, I didn't. I took you out because your response to the air ball and then your response to getting taken out. So, you know, that we, we kind of educate them on, you know, our standards and how we want to respond. Well, I love this coach. I mean, th th this role playing that you're talking about, I mean, again, just brings such attention to the different situations for all of them. And I'm imagining in these situations, too, that the role play is for the whole team to be able to be involved and to be able to see it. For sure. For sure. I, I think, you know, over my years, especially being an assistant at, at Florida, a lot of times we do individual meetings. They can be, you know, not as productive as, you know, with a group because we had, you know, we had Trey Mann you know, with Oklahoma City Thunder. And Trey was extremely unselfish. And 
you know, we have individual meetings telling them, you got to be aggressive. You got to do this. You got to gotta shoot more. And he was so unselfish. He needed the crowd. He needed the, the other, his other teammates to hear that in front of them for him to be comfortable, you know, being more aggressive. So I think sometimes we don't share enough information in front of the team as opposed to individuals. Right. And in, in terms of this, you're being specific with the player as well. So that like people know you're talking about this player, right? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. We, we, we're really transparent. I think, I think players appreciate it when you, you know, we, we don't call them call outs. We call them call ups. I think they, they appreciate when, you know, you're on the floor and this, you, you say it directly to who you're talking about. I couldn't agree more. And, uh, you know, in terms of coaching responses instead of the mistakes, I love that. I love the phrasing. I love the concept. Can you give us an example from, say, a tactical perspective within a basketball practice? Because most of them so far have been behavioral, but this is also going to be able to be applied to tactical development or technical development as well, right? Yeah, I, I think so. And I, I think this is kind of behavioral and tactical. You know, a lot of times – you know, coaching shot selection is probably one of the hardest things to do. And, you know, when somebody, we don't say it's a bad shot. We just call them shooting turnovers. So then it kind of registers. But a lot of times when you asking players, what else could you have done? So you shoot this shot. What else could you have done better than shooting this? So then I, I think it helps them understand the game. It helps them see the game. I, I think the players nowadays don't watch full games. You know, like when we was growing up, you sat there and you watched full games. So shot selection is different based on the time of the game and and who it is. So we like to ask them that. And then a lot of times, you know, when you when when you're playing or you're playing five on five, we usually praise we praise the outcome. We praise the execution. So if there's we we're louder with it. So if it's a bang bang, you know, extra corner three, and somebody misses it. You know, we, we'll be louder about that because a lot of a lot of this generation, even the sport we're in, is an outcome, you know, based kind of society. So for us, it's like, OK, we start teaching when it's a good outcome, but bad, you know, bad possession. Take us deeper if you can with that, because I love that. I mean, you're you're again evaluating the decision independent of the outcome. So take us deeper into that, because that's so important, I think, in terms of not just helping the players that are involved in the action, but they're helping the players that weren't involved in the action, but still help make the play possible. Yeah, I think it I think it also helps build team chemistry because it shows how everybody was needed in that possession for that outcome or just because somebody makes a tough shot. You know, that's what they're going to hear is, oh, man, that's a great shot, but it didn't have to be a tough shot if we execute it the right way and did what we're supposed to do. So I think it also helps them understand the game, but it also makes, you know, the guys that aren't showing up in the stat sheet or whatever, it makes them feel like a, a big part of it. So that's why we, we try to, you know, praise that even more. So we fully understand this year, you might not be running as much floppy, but take us into floppy a little bit as an example. <laughs> so a player coming off a of floppy, because you're connecting all this back to obviously style of play. Take us, right. a player's coming off of a floppy screen. I'm guessing that instead of there being, you must do this, there are possibilities for this player. But then within that, you can obviously coach their response and then help them understand what are some possibilities that might be better for them. Yeah, so we we like to find, you know, sometimes we'll run two different versions of floppy. Sometimes where, you know, it's two guys continuous, continuously coming off the floppy action. Sometimes, it's, you know, the diamond kind of action. And we try to find, you know, the worst defenders who can't chase all this stuff. And usually if you create that separation, you know, the big's going to uphill help and we've, get, we've gotten a lot of dump offs with that. And a lot of times if you watch our games, it's usually late in the game because we, we run the ball screen continuity. And so after guys are getting tired, the last thing you want to do the last two minutes of the game is chase guys off pin downs. So for us, it's, you know, Daquan Smith, Brian Antoine, Kenyon Giles, those guys – they're to the point now they understand the reads when guys try to cheat the plays. And, and you know, we we break that down. Screen and angles are really important for us. You know, if you set the screen too low, there's no no room to bump and fade. So it's also on the bigs too, you know, the angles of the screens. 
seeing ball screen continuity definitely saw it on your film love it uh <laughs> big fan of the template of ball screen continuity the challenge with ball screen continuity as you know is that it becomes very predictable so talk to us because again within yeah. what i watched it looks like there's some unpredictability within it so talk to us about how you build that yeah, a lot of times, you know, we have different, they're kind of reads and each player understands their strengths. So, you know, if we want a guy that, you know, if there's a guy in the middle and we want the guy setting the pin down in the zoom, we want him getting the shot. Those are usually our best shooters. He's the guy, you know, the guys we want zooming the most. And the guys we want coming off the ball screens, they'll fake a zoom and come off. We call that quick. So it's more personnel based on the options that they do they could do you know multiple options but you know if if you're a ball handler these are your first two options and they know that but a lot of times the thing about the ball screen continuity with the two bigs is like you said you can get predictable and then so the defense is defending wing ball screens the whole game and they get comfortable with that so when we feel like we're not getting anything out of it we'll start doing middle ball screen stuff so the, you know that's kind of how how we combat that because teams have gotten really good side ball screens. So when you move it into the middle, is that just a shifting of the spacing? It's the same yeah, concept, is. but just shifting the spacing. It's, it's the same concept, but obviously you got one big, you know, setting the middle ball screen. Another big is, you know, searching low underneath. And now you got those two shooters that are, that are searching around. So, you know, just a lot of different pin downs in the ball screens just to give defense a different look when they feel like they've, you know, defended them. Yeah. And it's such a simple concept, really. Like, even if you think about something basic like horns, it's like horns is so adaptable to be run from different locations. Why does it just right. have to be run off the top? It can be run from the wing. It can right. be run from different angles, different directions, all that. So you're yeah. essentially just doing that with something they already know. Yeah. The, the, and the main thing with all the ball screens is like, it, it doesn't matter what kind of ball screen you you know, offense you run, if your bigs aren't creating separation by sprinting or getting a screen, and it's probably not going to work. One of the nuances with ball screen that I think is hard at the college level, I think the handlers become so much better at being able to make decisions, but the screener and the screening angle, and you already referred to screening angle a little bit on floppy. So talk to us about some of the development of that ball screen screening angle to try and force the defender over top of the screen to be able to t draw two. Yeah, we, and we tell them, we said, you know, we, we, we show them the angle, we drill it, and we don't even care if you make contact with the defender. Just get them to go over top. You got one job. So you to, and, and obviously, if they go under it, we'll flip it. Yeah, your job is to get them to go over top. I think too many times the, the ball screener is looking at the offensive player, and the offensive player is going to do his job. So you, your job is just look at the defender and get him to go over that screen. And when you say drill it, what type of things are you doing? Because you reference this within play. Are you creating that situation yeah. out of some context of three on three, four on four, or five on five? We'll do a lot of it out of three on three. And then, you know, on one side and make the opposite lane line out of bounds. Because in our ball screen continuity, we don't want to drag it over too far. So you got to make a better decision with limited space. But the biggest thing we drill is how fast and how much our bigs change the speeds when they go ball screen. We talk to us a little bit about that. What uh, what type of things are you trying to get your bigs do in terms of those? Act like they don't know what's going on. So sometimes I don't. <laughs> so sometimes I don't know if they're acting or they really don't know what's going on. I say you you got to have some game to you. I think too many times like players learn the plays, but now the next step is having game to to the play. So you know we have we have a point guard from New York. I said you your job is to act like you're a scammer. So. Whatever you're doing or whatever read you're supposed to make, make the defender think you're not doing that. So I say you got to scam, you got to scam the defense. And that's what we do with our bigs. It's like, you know, if if you're standing, you know, in the dunk spot or, or you know, low corner, act like you're not doing nothing and then just, you know, take off. So that that's what we emphasize with change of speeds. It's such a great point. I mean, if anyone's coached young players and especially young players on inbound, they tend to stare at where they're going. And it's like, you actually know the play. You don't have to look at where you're going. Right, right, they don't right. know the play. So it is yeah. a fascinating part yeah. of the process of teaching. And uh, coach, the other thing that really was highlighted for me and in looking into kind of you and your background in the program is the importance of, you know, building an organization in the right way. And uh, particularly around the phrasing, which I love, the importance of invisible ingredients in your organization. Can you talk to us about those invisible ingredients? 
I think that's really important. I think it makes your players have an appreciation for who's around. And it shows, you know, if we don't value the people who aren't getting credit, it's the same thing when that box score comes out where you see somebody scoring 20 points, but the guy screening for them has two. So, you know, it's, it's a microcosm of what we're trying to teach, you know, when the, when the box score comes out. So we always give them a pop quiz, you know, throughout the year of people in our building, people on our campus who we feel like they should know. You know, we have a, a custodian. Her name is Miss Becky. And obviously she cleans the locker room. So we took a picture because and you know, I think you'll appreciate this. I always think every year I take a picture of what the locker room is supposed to look like, what my definition of clean is, because me and yours may be totally different. You may say, oh, it is clean. So I take a picture and I send it to them and I say, OK, this is the standard. And so it's funny, you know, one time that the locker was dirty, the locker room was dirty. So Miss Becky cleans the whole building. And so she came up to our staff, talked to us for 45 minutes to an hour about what she does every day, how she cleans, all that stuff. So I followed around one day and saw what she did. So I said, just how she talked to us for 45 minutes to an hour, I told her to go talk to them about what she does. And so when she talked to them, we never had any problems, you know, out of it again. But I said, I'm not listening to that for two hours. I'm not listening to it twice. So y'all gonna listen to it one time for Miss Becky. I love that. I mean, talk about unseen hours. That's the true definition yeah. of unseen hours, right? The things that your players don't see behind the scenes that helps them become a better version of themselves. And I imagine the other thing is it creates this understanding, which I always try and share with young people is like, are you making someone's life better or worse today? And that right. comes back to your definition of clean versus sometimes theirs, right? <laughs> right. And and that's what, you know, I work for Mike Young, who when he was at Wofford, and, you know, he always told the players, don't create more work for other people. And, you know, that's that's what we're trying to get those guys to realize. I love it. So what inspired you to start quizzing your players on the people around campus? And more specifically, then, wh- how do you feel this has helped your players play better basketball individually than a team? I, I started doing that because I don't think this generation of student athletes, I don't think they they ask enough questions or we teach them how to ask questions. So. Or they like enter. So, you know, if they have a quiz, then they'll, when somebody, when you walk up to them and you say, you know, I'm Chris Oliver, now they're listening more because they don't know if it's going to be on the quiz. And I'm, I'm sure you've been around many times where somebody introduced himself and you instantly forgot their name. So you tell them, you know, you got to repeat it a few times. Like, oh, Chris, nice to meet you. But I, I think what it does is, is like, you know, and I get this is where I got the idea because I played with Joe Alexander at West Virginia, who was the eighth overall draft pick. So Joe, this is before we had a practice facility, Joe used to work out all kinds of crazy hours. And during the interview process, when NBA scouts were asking, you know, about intel on Joe, they asked one of the custodians who used to, you know, let him in the gym or whatever. And it turns out Joe, you know, Joe was real close with him. Joe used to give him shoes that he didn't wear. And they were too big for him, but he still wore them. And I just said, you never know in this interview process, even if you're playing in Europe or whatever, who, you know, who they're going to ask. Coach, that's such a great example of highlighting the value of what you're trying to share with your players. And you brought up West Virginia. And I think what's also unique is that you played for Coach Beeline and Coach Huggins, you know, two Hall of Famers and two great coaches with two different styles of play. And it just, again, exemplifies how you can play different ways and be successful. Right. And and the biggest thing, <clears throat> obviously, it helped me because I've been through coaching change, you know, when I was coaching. And now when I got here, I knew what they were going through. But the biggest thing I realized is not only it's not what you teach is what you emphasize. So with being mine, my junior year, you know, big time shooters, we played one three one zone. We didn't rebound the ball. Great. Hugs comes in the next year. Now we're this great rebounded the team with the same guys so we were like top you know top 40 in the country in rebound and, and with under beeline we were like in the 200s and it wasn't a magic drill that we did it was what we emphasized and you know <clears throat> they're two totally different people and they emphasize different things but that's why we were better rebound just because of that i didn't think of it from that perspective because you've been through that type of coaching change did that make you a little bit more effective at coming into the coaching change that you came into at Radford? I think so. I think so. And, you know, I went through one at Florida, you know, when we went to Louisiana Tech to Florida. I went through that one. 
And then, but as a head coach coming through a coaching change, like you, you understand, you know, what the guys are thinking. And I shared that with them in our first team meeting. I said, I get it. Some of you guys are happy. I'm here. Some of you guys are mad. I'm here. Probably the guys who didn't play that much are really, really excited. I said, I understand, you know, I've been through it. I understand what you, you what you're going through, but everybody's so connected now. I coached, you know, Keontae Johnson at Florida and I had, some Virginia kids here, obviously. And so they had already called him and asked him what he thought of. So, you know, I was good in their mind. What is the feedback then from the people that you've highlighted within your community with these invisible ingredients? Because again, it must make them feel more connected to you and your program. I, I just wanted them to feel like they're a part of our program and that our guys are personable. You have to think this is in my hometown. So you know, growing up here, being in the community, my guys being in the community, that's a big deal because if they're not or if I'm not, I'm going to hear about it, you know, from my mom and dad. So I, I think it's helped with us with attendance here. You know, season when we broke the season ticket, sales record, broke it last year, broke it again this year. So I think that's how them being personable guys. Well, I love it. And it goes beyond just winning or losing in terms of connecting them to your organization, your program, that you're trying to do things the right way. And uh, maybe in terms of uh, another coach, whether it's a high school coach or college coach that would want to start this type of concept within their program, what are some ways to be able to start it and to, to be able to build this? I just get a baseline, see where they are. You know, just like, you know, if you have a, a custodian who you feel like, like anybody you feel like they should know, you know, the principal's name, you know, the AD's name, and you can go down the line, like, you know, cafeteria worker, you know, I, I, when I recruit kids, I always, I usually ask custodians how they are or the cafeteria worker, because if you're mean, if you're a basketball player, you're mean to a cafeteria worker. Uh, I don't know if I can have you in my program. So I, I think that, you know, just seeing where they are, like, what is this person's name? You'll be amazed by how many of you don't know people's names. It, it is amazing. And uh, I've been to a number <laughs> of practices already this fall. And, uh, you know, and I would say this is a hallmark of most programs is that any visitor in the gym, the players come over and introduce themselves, whether cued by the coach or individually as well. And that seems to be obviously a good characteristic, especially from a player's perspective about future employability. I'm trying to meet people right. because they could potentially lead to future <laughs> jobs, right? Right, right. And, uh, you know, the people that come to your games, you know, you, if you, I told them, I said, you don't have to have a full conversation with everybody, but just say good morning. And, and it's funny, we do this thing. It's called, I got it from a good friend of mine. You probably, Brett Ledbetter, we, we do that. So we did a video on how to get on and off the elevator. You know, obviously I've been on elevators with my guys and somebody that they don't know gets on the elevator and you're standing right on the buttons. The, you ask that person, okay, what floor are you going to? And so we had to teach that. So, you know, those things that like, you know, that, that you think they know, you, they don't know. It's amazing. An elevator is such a great example, I think for generally yeah. everyone, because it can be uncomfortable or it can be comfortable. And right. it's, it's a certain extent how you approach it in terms of what you just said and all the other things. If you're on your phone or you initiate a contact or even just a hello, or good morning. And it just changes that whole ride from potentially awkward to a much more in, in inclusive ride, doesn't it? Right. It's great. Coach, we talked a little bit about offense and talked about some of your adaptability on offense. Take us through a little bit of your defensive system and defensive philosophy, because I know that's a hallmark of what you've done in terms of building up Bradford as well. Yeah. Um, I, I think the biggest thing is like creating that mindset. You know, you could do whatever schemes or, or whatever you want, but you have to create that mindset and accountability. Like for us, we sub for defensive mistakes early in the game. So then you don't have to sub later in the game in terms of energy effort, you know, having active hands. And you got to think if somebody on your team is playing 35 minutes a game and you sub them out, you know, for not communicating loud enough and they're really out of the game for 20 seconds, those 20 seconds feel like three minutes. So... You know, our, our system is, you know, we we weak ball screens. We 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 don't have a lot of different ball screen coverages. I, I feel like the way we recruit, you know, we had a lot of international guys who spoke different languages we didn't understand a lot of. And then you have a whole bunch of new guys. Like, we want to get really good at things that we feel is really important. So we just have one call on ball screen defense. We just call it weak. And we always send the ball handler to, to their left hand, you know, like Dave Smart. So we always send them to the left hand. Sometimes we'll trap it. You know, sometimes we'll go under the ball screen, but we always call weak. 
So then they're not confused in communication. We mix up defenses. You know, we've been really good at that. Sometimes if you have a primary ball handler, you don't have, you know, more than one, we call it hunt. And it's, you know, we want to make, we want to make other guys playmakers. So I think the biggest thing, and I learned this from, you know, being an SEC, the biggest thing, I think a lot of times when people scout, they try to find the best players. We try to find the worst players who we don't have to guard. It's easy to find the best players. So let's find the worst ones and don't guard them. It makes sense. And then that dictates a little bit of what you do on offense as well, I imagine, in terms of hunting some matchups. Right. Correct. And uh, talk to us a little bit about defensively. You talked about weak. You know, in terms of that, one of the biggest challenges in weak is not opening your stance too much and yet still influencing the player where you want to go. So do you have any kind of teaching points? Because I think that's the most common question I get asked. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and it's hard because this is what I always tell them. I say, like, right now, we have a lot of trust issues. I said, because if you're guarding the ball and you keep turning your head, so we got trust issues. I said, we're not there yet. So we, we just call them trust issues on defense. I said, well, we're really elite. You're not turning your head. And, and I think a lot of times, and we teach them how to communicate, a lot of times coaches are yelling, hey, man, you got to talk. You got to talk. Well, you they Half the time, they don't know what to say. So we say, if you don't know what to say, say what you see. And so I may be pressuring the ball on the perimeter and nothing's happening. So we tell our guys, okay, say, hey, coach, you're by yourself. You're by yourself. You're good. I said, that's how you build trust. So right to your question, like, yeah, you do have that problem if you got trust issues. So trust issues, particularly in that example around the fact that they don't want to influence it weak because they're not sure that they're going to get the support they need in terms of that. So talk to us a little bit. Is it, is it the, if the ball screen situation, it's weak, the big's the primary supporter. If it's not a ball screen, it's just say on the wing type of action before a ball screen comes, what are we doing in terms of weak when we're in help? Is there a flood? Is there an overload? Is there an extra support? You're talking about no ball screen going on. Yeah, no ball screen. I don't I don't like forcing it a particular way. Okay. So we teach correct hand close out. So if you're a left hand shooter, I'm closing out to the right hand. So naturally that's making you go to the hand you really don't want to go to. Because I've never taught, okay, send them baseline or send them middle, because then I think that allows excuses. That's just how I feel. And so I say, no, don't let them, don't let them straight line drive. You got to make them change directions. We can't, we can't guard a straight line drive. So yeah, we, we don't emphasize force them in a particular way. We just don't let them get to where they want to get to. So weak is just a ball screen concept. And then it's, everything it's, else is yeah. to play square. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Awesome. And then defensively, you talked about being very simple somewhat, but adaptable at the same time to scout. So talk to us a little bit about you've identified some of their weaker players. What are some things that we can do to maximize our defense when we've identified certain types, let's say, uh, like a non-shooting big or a non-shooting guard or obviously someone who's just, you know, very right handed or very left handed? I think the biggest thing is like the mental part of it. You know, when you're not guarding somebody and you're helping, and then a lot of times, like, if a guy makes a shot early, we're okay with it. You know, sometimes you get those players who look at you and say, you, you said he couldn't shoot. And we're like, we're fine, we're fine. I think the biggest, I think, I think the biggest thing, too, is, like, understanding, you know, how, how many they crash on the offensive glass. I think that that's a big deal for us because we – too many times you see guards leaking out. We call it rebounded down. So, you know, we have really small guards. So a lot of times they have to crack down on the bigs as well. But I would say the probably the biggest thing defensively is, you know, the other coach gets mad when you're not guarding those guys. And then they have to play a little different. You know, I think that's the biggest thing is just when you just don't guard people. It can really throw you off too. And, you know, one of the hardest things when you don't guard someone is when that player makes a shot, especially early in the game. And you have to give your team that coach clap, which is like, that's all right. That's all right. (laughs) And uh, what are some ways to be able to build that kind of confidence in your players, that self-efficacy and kind of the game plan and understanding that that was our choice and it's going to work out in the long run? Just showing them the film. You know, if you're trying to highlight a guy that can't make shots, showing them what the shot looks like, showing them how bad they miss and, you know, sometimes showing on percentages, but you have to educate your guy on what is a good percentage and what's not a good percentage because a lot of them don't know that either. 
So, you know, in the film process, you know, scout are just showing them. Uh, a lot of times we show them all the good clips. We Sometimes you show them the bad clips too. Always have to show them the bad clips too. And take us into one of your film sessions. What's the goal in terms of one of your uh, team film sessions? How long the film session is? What type of things that uh, you really value in terms of bringing them out? You talked about that role-playing scenario. We'll, we'll get yeah. now more to the technical tactical of how you're trying to develop your team. We do we do, do a lot of film. I don't like, I like doing short film segments, but multiple ones. I don't like doing long film sessions. And a lot of our teaching is in the film room. A lot of it is when we get on the court, it's kind of quick, quick points. You know, I, I hate it. I developed my philosophy of what I didn't like as a player. And I didn't like staying on the court for five minutes after you, you know, you went up and down and now the coach is explaining and teaching and break. We do a lot of our teaching through the film. So our film sessions, you know, probably 10 minutes at the most. Yeah, 10 minutes at the most. But a lot of times we give them opportunities to talk because I don't think they talk about basketball situations on their own as a team with only when we're in there. So sometimes we may go and film and cut it short and say, hey, y'all talk about whatever problems you have going on because after practice, everybody's going their separate ways. Just curious, and um, I know somewhat it's not the best use of time, but you referenced the <clears> fact that, and I totally agree, players don't watch full games anymore. Is there a value right. to having players watch a full game in some context so that they can understand kind of the flow of the game from beginning to end and some of the things that as a coach, you're really trying to highlight, you know, throughout a game? Yeah, it is. I, I think sometimes you cut the clip too short and it may be a situation where, okay, if you run it for 30 more seconds, they understand the context of what you're talking about or the flow because every game has a story. So like the full story is a lot of times missed. But, you know, you're you're pressed on time. So you kind of – you want to do both. But, like, our post-game film, most of the clips are just called decision-making. And a lot of people think decision-making, oh, that means, you know, that's a bad pass or you should have passed it here. But our decision-making means you shouldn't have fouled this guy right here. This is, this is a dumb foul. Now they're close to the bonus. Now they go to the free throw line two minutes later and they're racking up – like – so our post game film is usually just all decision making. So and it's kind of like you know, what, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, coach. It's, it's kind of like what you said. Like you know, they we know they don't watch full games, but if you when you watch full games, you see decisions. You absolutely see decisions, and uh, I love that aspect of it because I I think even like I've been in film sessions before with coaches where they think they're pointing out something tactical and tactical, but ultimately what it almost always comes back to is decision making within that. It's uh it's right. not how did they shoot the shot. It's like whether or not that was the right shot to shoot in that context, and whether there is another right. possibility. And that's really what film can help you with. Can right. Right. And I think that, you know, some guys learn different. Some guys learn through film. Some guys learn through, you know, walking through it. But I think I think everybody can everybody gets better through film. You just don't want to make it long. You mentioned walking through it. Take us through that, because I think that's an underrated part of teaching and learning nowadays. And I think a lot of these things come back to I think we're just smarter about not driving our players into the ground with all these long practices and drills and all this different stuff. And, you know, the film and the walkthrough, you can still get these perceptual and decision-making type reps that build understanding. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, I think the NBA does it, you know, because they play so many games. So you look at NBA walkthroughs and what they get accomplished. <clears throat> and those are some of the smartest players, you know, in the world. And so, you know, I think walkthroughs are helpful because it's also in a non-pressure situation. So it's a lot of times it's easier to see it and it's easier to digest it when, you know, you don't have a lot of pressure. When would you use walkthroughs? You know, because I think typically we talk about just walkthroughs as the, you know, the the day of the game type of walkthrough or the day before the game type of walkthrough. But really, they're, they're learning opportunities throughout. So take us through that. So we usually walk through. Like if we have a film session, we usually walk through, we'll go to the court and we'll walk through before we stretch. So if I want to add a new play, I add it before they stretch and we just walk through the play because I don't want to stop practice and then say, hey, we're adding a new play and then practice gets slow and stale and you got to rev it back up. So anytime we want to walk through something, we do it before we stretch. And then we stretch and then we go, you know, we start getting after it and then we'll 
reintroduce what we want. Coach, so many great insights already. And maybe talk to me about how do you address above and below the line behaviors? Maybe some behaviors that aren't aren't what you want within your program. Traditionally, we make them run, we yell at them, all these different things. That's not the world we exist in now. So give us some insights. Yeah, I think I think as coaches, you know, a lot of times we catch them doing something wrong. You know, we try, we also highlight when we catch them, you know, doing things right. I know like what we do, like when a guy's late, we don't make them run. I, I don't do that anymore. Like this, these student athletes, they love their time. They love to have their time. So we make them right next play speed on the dry race board. And that's what we're trying to emphasize. Okay, move on from the mistake. And they got to do it with their offhand 500 times. <clears throat> some some of them get up to 1,000. And it takes like two hours. So they'd rather run and then like be done with it in five minutes and then go about their day. So they always say, hey, can I just can I just run? <laughs> and we say no. And then, you know, like situations like we try to be creative, like our guys, was it, it was two years ago? It was, yeah, it was, it, was, it was last year. Actually, last year. You know, we had an issue in the weight room where guys were going to early morning lifts and they walk in, shoes untied, eating oatmeal, eating cereal, whatever. Just not prepared. And that's one of our standards, be prepared. So the, our strength coach told me, and so we had practice later that day at 2.30. So I told my staff, I said, hey, I'm going to be late. I'm going to walk in with my shoes untied, eating a bowl of Fruity Pebbles from downstairs. And so I walked in like 2.29, was eating Fruity Pebbles in a circle. And I told him, I said, hey, guys, we got to get better today, man. Like, whatever you got in, you let's figure out how to get better today. And they started laughing. And they, they knew what I was doing. And I was like, well, why are you holding me to, you know, a higher standard like hold yourself to the standard like you guys know you weren't prepared so like what do you have to do to come in prepared coach do you have an acting background i love this stuff i mean exaggeration is one of the best <laughs> forms of teaching isn't it yeah and i got that idea because i think about how they learn now and th this generation is more visual than ever before because you think about it like a lot of them aren't even on x or twitter whatever you want to call it because there's there's not enough pictures. They're on Instagram, they're all stuff that's more visual. So a lot of stuff we do, we we visualize it. And you know, we try to reenact we try to act it out. I love it. I think the best part about it that is fruity, fruity pebbles, of course. They were good. Uh, they were good. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> it makes me want to have them again. I don't think I've had them for a long time. That's awesome. Coach, I mean, the other part that we've kind of circled around a little bit throughout this process is obviously, you know, the transfer portal and all these different things. The fascinating thing for me is evaluation and how you evaluate a player for your program, because almost like, like there's a bounty of possibilities now that didn't exist. But that actually yep. makes it harder in a lot of ways. So talk, take us through a little bit of the evalu evaluation process. I think the with now the transfer portal, obviously you're watching guys on Synergy. So you may not know them unless you recruit them before. So I think the the interview process is way more important than it's ever been. Because you think some of these transfers, you're you're meeting them on Zoom, then they come to your campus. So I've what I've done over years since I was at Florida is, you know, with the NBA combine, you know, the interview process is really big in the NBA. And I've compiled a list of those NBA combine questions that they ask, you know, that they ask the, uh, the players. And so we ask those same questions because it's like this. It's like, Chris, you work hard? You're going to say, yeah, I work hard. But the, the, the real question is, Chris, give me an example of how hard you work. So now it's like, okay, I get up in the morning, you know, I, I eat fruity pebbles in a smoothie. I go to the gym, you know, I start out with 50 left-hand layups and I make, you know, 100 right-hand layups. And, and so then it's like, okay, this this guy's prepared. It, it's such a great thing to be able to obviously get them to be able to dive deeper in terms of their thinking about like, again, this generation, all generations, I think generally we want to give yes, no sure type of answers but exactly. we want them to dive deeper because again that helps them engage with the material more that leads to deeper learning but it also again creates this understanding of what it means to be a human as they get into jobs and life and all these different things too coach really good insights in terms of your program and the different things that go on behind the scenes and obviously style of play a little bit as well so this year i know you're excited for this team so what, so what are some 
possibilities for this team? And then what are some things that have to go right for this team to be able to meet those possibilities? I like the fact, you know, I, I talked about it earlier. I like the fact that we have a lot of returners that were impact guys, basically four, basically four starters back. You know, Tinian Giles was all freshman team. He came off the bench by choice. You know, he wanted to. So, you know, I, I like the returners we have. You know, Justin Archer was number six in the country in offense rebounding. He's back. And just that, just the guys that we have returning that understand what we, you know, what we want and what we want to do. And the newcomers, you know, I'm excited about. We have one of the guys who's number three in the country in defense rebounding last year. So I think what has to go right, like we have to really, really come together as a team. And, you know, I talked about early the trust issues. We have to develop those and, and get better at that. And we got to stay healthy. I mean, a guy like Brian Antoine from, you know, transfer from Villanova got honorable mention all Big South and he missed five Big South games. So, you know, I, I think that's that's a big part of it. I mean, as long as it, with everybody, you know, every other team wants to say the same thing. But, you know, for us who have been through some injuries, it's really important. And take us through, you got a head start going overseas. Talk to yeah. us about that trip. I mean, to Asia, that sounded, it looked like, and it seemed like an amazing experience. Yeah, it was good too, because, you know, going to Japan, we have a Japanese kid on our roster, Ibu Yamazaki, who actually tore his ACL a week before we went over. Awesome. And one, we didn't realize how big of a rock star he was, or he is over there. You know, we, we're in one of the biggest cities in the world, all these kids and people running up to him, taking pictures, crying. But the tournament we was in is, you know, the World University Basketball Series. And the 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 good thing about it is this foreign trip was actually tournament format. So every game meant something. And, you know, you, sometimes you go on these foreign trips and you just play in this team and then you go eat, you go sightsee. So ours was like, you know, a real atmosphere because those teams over there were actually in season. So their season goes on in the summertime while we're out of season. And so I didn't realize how good, you know, some of those university teams are over there, like Adeneo and NCCU. Those teams were really good. And, you know, some of the players over there, you know, there are guys that we've seen over here that, you know, maybe didn't qualify or went over there and wanted to get NIL because they were doing NIL before we were. So those teams were really good. And it, it helped it helped me just having to coach a different style. You know, I'm yelling at the refs trying to get the timeout, and I'm on the baseline, and I'm like, oh, I got to yell at these, these score table guys. So they're on the run, and I'm staying on the baseline where I'm used to. And I, I had to adjust, and I said, I got to stand more near scores table so I can get a quick timeout. You mentioned the officials. One of my favorite parts of coaching over in Asia was that none of the officials could <laughs> understand me. So it, it just helped me calm down and focus on yeah. what we needed yeah. to focus on, which was coaching the team, right? <laughs> yeah, and it was it was it was funny because you know they some of them tell you they didn't speak English, and then I see them talking to somebody. I'm like, I think they speak in English. You're trying to figure out if they're they really speak English or they're just telling you because they don't want to talk to you. So it helped me too, though. It did help me. I, I didn't worry about the officials. What a great experience. What a great trip. Uh, just tremendous. And uh, coach, we're excited to watch this year and uh, you're enjoyable to watch last year and I cannot, cannot wait. And I super appreciate you taking the time to be able to share the game with us. And I appreciate you having me on. been a big fan for years.